Welcome, everyone. And a very happy new year to everyone out here, to all our listeners for 2021. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Dr. Surya Kaur. She's a doctor of acupuncture, practitioner of energy medicine, certified clinical hypnotherapist, kundalini yoga teacher, somatic movement educator, holistic practitioner, and a raw slash vegan food expert. She has a huge footprint on yoga as she has opened multiple yoga ashrams and taught yoga in prisons. She has a super interesting stories on raw food consumption, liver cleansing, and detoxification. So welcome, Surya ma'am. Thank you. Welcome. So nice to be with you today. Thank you for having me. Nice to be with you too. So um, I'll jump right in. What made you take up this life of holistic living? I think actually I was born to do it because I didn't really have a specific reason. I wasn't going out looking for a teacher. I wasn't, I didn't have an illness, so I was looking for a cure. Actually, I was uh, in Los Angeles during the 60s and I was, uh, had a boyfriend and he was in a group called Frank Zappa and the Mother's Unvention. And he was a little older than me. And he was already into yoga and meditation. So actually, he's the one who brought me to my teacher and turned me on to yoga and meditation. So it was just a natural thing. I wasn't really looking, but I got right into it. I went to classes twice a day, every day. And then within a very short time, I went to Washington, D.C. to open up a yoga ashram. And it was a yoga ashram for 25 years. I didn't stay there for 25 years. But and that's how I found it, and uh, it was a, a beginning. And we taught classes every day, and then we had longer every Sunday, so we served oh. free food. And that's how my yoga life really began, other than in Los Angeles taking classes twice wow. a day. So, I guess you have also yeah. had a huge connection with the Sikh Dharm, too, right? You had started an organization called 3HO. Yes, that is exactly what happened. Not, of course, it wasn't formed yet when I met my teacher, but it became that. And yes, my religion, I practiced the Sikh religion. I became a Sikh in 1972, I believe, or 74, like that. And it was just something that I, I learned about and I, and I just embraced it. It was just a part of me. So I kind of contribute to that to probably past life or something. Like I say, I, unusually so, I wasn't looking for anything. But when it came to me, I took it. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of gifts are, come our way and we have to either embrace it or not embrace it. I embraced it. And uh, I, th- I think it's such a very pure religion. But I like to embrace all religions. It's more about the religion of consciousness. And, and that's what Kundalini Yoga is all about. It was always pinned Kundalini Yoga, the yoga of awareness. Mm. makes you aware of your actions and your reactions and yourself and the people around you and how you behave and how you talk and how you are in life for people. So when you slow down and you're not always acting and reacting to everything and you see everything for what's really happening, then you have a very different reaction in your life and it's a very calmer life. You know, we're not just acting and reacting to each other. Mm, that's true that's true and how to attain that to how to attain that calm is through your breath through controlling your breath Mm, that's true that's true yes we'll definitely come into the digs of kundalini yoga but uh just taking a few steps back you mentioned about a teacher i guess uh you're referring to the maharishi mahesh yogi ji is that correct No, but I did start with Maharishi. I was quite young. I was 14 or 15. Somehow he came to Los Angeles, and I can't remember the detail, but I remember I did meet him, and I became a Maharishi meditator first. That was the first, uh, my first teacher, you might say. And And it was also in the infancy of that time as well. And I remember meeting him, and I remember he looked at me, and he goes, Oh, you look like you're from my country, you know, because I, in India, people don't think I look like I'm Indian, but outside of India, people do think I look like I'm Indian. Mm. So, yeah, so I don't even exactly know how I got there, but I think 
in the late 60s, we were being, uh, we were turning on to, um, a lot of people were into drugs, but they were turning off into drugs and going natural, natural foods, yoga, meditation. You know, the Beatles were, you know, into the Eastern music. So the Eastern music was coming. So the East was coming to the West in the late 60s. So I guess she was primarily into transcendental meditation, right? Yes. One of the founders. He, he, yes, he gave, we had a little initiation. They give you a mantra. You're supposed to keep it secret. And then you just meditate and practice on that mantra. And then so, I, I met, my, met another teacher after that, who I learned Kundalini Yoga from. He was also a Sikh. And I think what he was teaching was the tenets of the Sikh religion without calling it the Sikh religion. Wow, wow. So how, do, how did both these teachers impact you in your formative years? All the teachers in my life have affected my life greatly, everything. But I, I have to say the greatest teacher of all that I've had is India. Just being, moving, living in India, I feel that was my greatest teacher. It teaches you everything and it teaches you about patience and tolerance and kindness. It teaches you not to react. It, it, it teaches, it, you know, it, it, I call it the teacher. Anybody wants to teach you, I go to India. Just, just move in India. Just move around in India. You'll, you'll have a great teacher. That is a very fresh perspective from someone, let's say, who's primarily living outside of India. I know people living within India won't have some different views on that. But yes, I do agree <laughs> on you too. Yeah, because since my travels within India, I've learned a lot from different cultures, from different uh, age groups. I think, you know, I lived in India 20 years. I lived in Punjab for the first, I think, five years. And then I lived in... Um, New Delhi for 15 years. And it was amazing how I saw, I'm going to, I'm going to call it the hand of God for lack of any, ter any other term. You might call it energy. You might call it consciousness. You could, everybody has a different way of referring to it. But I just watched how everything came to me and how it fit together, one person and the connecting another person. And I just watched the flow of life. And fortunately, I was able to embrace it and not stop it from happening. So those years in India were, were very powerful, me, powerful for me to see if you, can, if you use your eyes, you can see how everything and how we are all very connected to each other and how all the gifts come to us in life, we can either embrace them or we cannot. We can take them or not. Can you share any few instances or experiences in India uh, I, as I was reading your profile, I saw that you have a lot of contribution done at the Anandpur Sahib, which is uh, Gurudwara near Chandigarh, uh, I guess an hour from Chandigarh. So yes, it's about an hour and a half drive. Uh, yes, I did a building project there for five years. I lived there for five years. Wow. And wow. Uh, it's a very special place. And... Uh, the energy is very special. All the five tuckets are very special. All the temples are very special. Before I, uh, after I moved away from Anand Prasad and went to New Delhi, um, in my last, the last neighborhood I lived in, I had every religion representative. I had two Sikh temples. I had a mosque. I had a Catholic church. I had a Buddhist temple. Not far away was a church, and not far away was a synagogue. And I love hearing all the mantras or all the sounds that come in the middle of the night from those temples. It's really something. And in Anand Prasad, especially because we were on a hill, I could hear the kirtan that starts early morning and you can just hear it in the early morning and it just resonates all over your being and your home. And it was really special. It's a very special place, um, Anand Prasad, but India is just a very special place. So, uh, again, speaking about Anandpur Sahib, um, working there or let's say living there for five years, do you think performing seva or service helps an individual live a grateful life? Absolutely. I have performed seva my, a good part of my adult life. And yes, absolutely. And just, you know, walking, 
on the marble and all the temples and the people who do kirtan every single morning and every single at the golden temple i've spent a lot of time in the golden temple also wow i've i've attended the amrit vela time at the golden temple uh, when they take out the uh, granth and uh, take it in the mandir and it's a very special time very special as a matter of fact they didn't allow women to touch it the pokey sub and they don't allow women to go and do say that inside the golden temple but i'm a little bit of a rebel <laughs> and nobody stopped nobody stopped me from also just touching and carrying it too i think it it has to do with how you feel about something mm. you know it's the same thing as we went on a um trek to himkund sab oh. you know we spent we spent 5 days you know hiking and we get to the top and it's the most incredible energy on the planet that i've experienced you get to the top the water the lake is ice cold and all the men are allowed to dip anywhere and they made this little tin house for the women to dip and we went up to the sevadars and i said i'm sorry but in the sikh religion we are all equal we are not going to dip there we are going to dip there where everybody dips they couldn't do anything about it because we were so um powerful in our truth because that is what the sikh religion is about and so we did it so we all did. we didn't stay in long because it's very very cold but it was just an incredible experience wow wow you have have traveled a lot in and around india not enough actually there's lots of more places i would like to go many more places i would like to go but yes i have been very fortunate in my life to go to some beautiful high places mm-hmm. that's pretty great that's high energy great. places so um so i'm moving on to what work you do is you are a huge proponent of eating raw food can you share your story on what you did in new mexico with eating the raw food and having a detox cleanse and what were your findings on it okay well i am a proponent of healthy food not just raw i did eat raw food for only 7 years and then i changed i did a combination of using the raw food ingredients but also cooking my body told me i needed more and i did and circumstances actually there was environmental circumstances sometimes you can't always uh, impose and eat raw food just everywhere you have to be flexible in life according to what you're doing but i started in new mexico some friends of mine were uh, into raw food and detox cleanses And so I spent a couple of weeks with them and I thought wow I re- this is really for me I'm going to do this. And so I started I started eating all raw. And then as you start eating all raw in those days it wasn't just eating some celery sticks and carrot sticks. It was actually making really fun tasty food and a, a new cuisine was being formed by the leaders of the raw food community community in those days. And so we learned how to make a fun lasagna but it was raw. or a fun pizza but it was raw or a burger or a falafel you know or curries um but it was all with raw ingredients and then i decided to do um a raw food cleanse for people and so the first one i did was for 10 days and i had about 5 6 people doing it and they had a really great experience they everybody loved it you know they couldn't believe that they were eating raw food because we just worked to make it very tasty so that started my raw food cleanse it kind of started you know providing cleanses for people and then i started to do raw food juices and nobody had that really heard of juicing yet i think now it's quite popular in mm. delhi but nobody had heard of raw food or you mentioned that uh, about how you had started preparing raw pizza or raw burger but how would uh, let's say if i say this to someone how would they take it in that uh, would everything be prepared as raw or uh, if if you can give an example yes. of how it is okay let's say for instance if we were going to make uh, a raw lasagna i would take zucchini which now you can find in india it was hard in the beginning and i would take a very like a potato peeler and i would make very thin strips 
of wide zucchini and that would become the noodles. And then I would usually do it the night before, put a little oil on it. And then overnight it softens just from the oil. Now I had a very soft noodle. We didn't need to really cook it. And then I would make a marinara sauce with sun-dried tomatoes and whole tomatoes, and then the seasonings that you would put in a tomato sauce to make it taste Italian. And then you could, I would make then a raw food cheese, a non-dairy cheese, which we would make from cashews. Uh, that's the most common nut in India and the easiest to make cheese. So I would do a combination of coconut meat, which is so available, and cashew. And could, together, I would ferment that. We would make it overnight. You know, we blend it up together in a high-speed blender, put it in a nut bag, and basically we would have cheese. So, and then I would make a pesto. So you would have layers, and it became a raw lasagna, and people loved it. Then I also had a dehydrator. So you could learn to make things like a meatball or a falafel using, basically raw food is fresh vegetables, nuts, fruits, um, seeds, things like that. But I also discovered in raw food, it's easy to wind up eating too much nuts, which I don't think is also good for everybody. So I, I kind of also thought the raw food diet is good, but I felt really good, never got sick a day in my life, but I didn't look that healthy. So I thought I'm missing something in my diet. So I started to add things to it as well. Let's say if someone wants to take up this lifestyle, so how do you advise someone to who's been having a regularly cooked meal with a lot of spices and a lot of things added to it? How do you advise someone to take up this lifestyle? And uh, if if you do advise someone, do you face any kind of resistance while giving this advice? Okay, first of all, I don't give advice unless somebody asks. I've learned that. I don't try to teach anybody anything unless they ask me and they're open and receptive to hear it. There are three really important things to do. You have to eat what you can assimilate. You have to assimilate, you have to digest, and you have to eliminate. If you're having trouble with what, if you're not being able to do those three things, then the food you are eating is not serving you. So I know there are IBS, there's a lot of illnesses, you know, all over that people have trouble with their gut, they have bloat, they have constipation, they don't go regularly, they can't lose weight. Perhaps they're not eating the right food. If anybody has a major illness, I do recommend go on a clean, raw food diet with juices and you can change your metabolism you can change the uh, chemistry in your body you can change your blood i just recently had a blood test and and uh, they were really surprised when they saw my blood test because i eat such a clean diet but you know my doctor said this is one of the best blood tests i've ever seen and i am 70 years old wow so it has to do with what you eat and I, you know, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, occasionally, I will have some wine, but I don't respond that well to it. So I'm not against anybody doing it. You have to listen to your body. You have to eat what your body responds to. I know a lot of people in India, they can't live without their salt. You know, it's really hard to live without their salt. That's true. And sometimes salt isn't good for you. You know, if you're getting puffy and blowing up, Maybe the salt is enough, especially as you age. You see, when you're young, it's easier. But as you age, your body, it, it, it needs less and less. It needs simple. It needs more simple foods. Uh, but one should just be happy when they're eating. You know, one should not eat and rush. And I think that's, it's a very nice thing in Indian culture. People do sit down and eat together. You know, and food is prepared with a lot of thought and love. So, um... Speaking about uh, the illnesses which you have just said, let's let's say if someone is having a weight issue, uh, and uh, because I know many people, and specifically one who has been trying to lose weight for quite some time, and uh, he joins the gym, he loses let's say four five kilos, feels good, but his target is to lose twenty, and. Uh, 
he's been having uh, uh, at least a lifestyle of eating outside food for the past 20 years now it's been very difficult for him to uh, break into losing weight how do you face such challenges well there's not one thing there's not like i'm going to take this pill and i'm going to lose weight i believe in three things positive movement positive meals and positive mind it takes three things and there's lots of different ways to achieve those things so the first thing i would do is to really take an intake on the person and see i ask them what are you eating what is your lifestyle what are you doing so you have to learn about what the person is doing how they operate because you can't just say go on a raw food diet you know you have to take baby steps sometimes because to lose weight i've never been overweight but when i started eating raw food there were parts on my back i'll call it my backside that just melted away i didn't try it just left me and um so it's also you have to be committed you have to have some discipline you have to make some changes in your daily life what time you eat what time you get up what time you sleep the meals prepared um it takes effort actually to lose weight so anybody who tells you it's easy i don't think it's so easy but it's very doable and very possible but the first step is you really have to want to and why do you want to because it makes you feel better you know the simple reason if you've got this big belly sticking out in front of you that's your navel energy that's your core energy that you're not living your optimum frequency or health because you, it's all stuck right here you know i see some people they can hardly walk sometimes they can hardly move and then i've seen some people who exercise like crazy and never lose weight you know i used to walk in modi gardens in the morning and you know people are working working they're they're walking so fast and they're so determined yet they never lose weight so it is what you eat it is your lifestyle it is your commitment to being healthy and then that means you know you know indian lifestyle parties they they eat late they start their parties late they serve food at midnight 1 o'clock in the morning these don't help you lose weight and then all the people who consume so much alcohol you know i've heard from several people during this covid go, they go well, you know the really good part about covid is there's no pressure to go to parties and drink we feel so much better but nobody wants to admit that while it's happening because of social pressure so again you know and as you get older older people like to go to sleep earlier i get up i go to bed early but i get up very early i get up at 4 o'clock in the morning you know so and i like it i really love those hours they're very quiet still mm. hours to be out doing things that's because of that i have to go to bed early because i get tired that early so you know so the, it's life it's lifestyle choices you make choices in life that you want to serve your highest good and you want to serve what's good for you and your heart not what somebody is telling you to do okay what you mentioned was a very valid point i know i even know many i was myself into long distance running i have ran three half marathons and i have many friends who are into marathon running but there are few who have who are not able to lose weight even after running let's say 20 marathons and uh, it's just there means they are also themselves surprised that why am i not able to lose weight even after running so much they might be like running at least uh, 50 kilometers a week but yet there's no the belly is yet there well that's probably because of what they're eating you know mm. what they choose to eat and then if they have a stressed lifestyle you know if you're worried about things if you're not getting along with your wife or your partner or your children it depends how stressed you are too so all these things add to to weight gain the toxicity toxicity in our water in our air uh in products you know if you're going to go to a regular store and buy all these pre-made products they're not the healthiest but you know fortunately in india people still cook they do cook at home mm, isn't that, that true still okay that, 
that is true that is true it I mean, it is, it might be less than the years you might have come let's say if you had come in the late 90s compared to today's time mm-hmm. it is definitely less but yes yet many people have been cooking a lot at home especially during the covid time and uh, again especially yeah especially during I, the covid yeah and again yeah i know where this is coming from it might be a comparison with the west side where there's a lot of either processed food being eaten or food which has been either ordered or bought from countries outside of us so yeah the exactly. fresh food is being cooked yet in india that's true yes it is it is and that's a, and that's wonderful and that is that is really great still because people here you know they go and they buy all this processed food and and uh, it's cheaper to buy big quantities and it's not really the healthiest food but this is also what they can afford and still in india it is nice to see that people do cook at home and sit down and eat together as well food is a very big part of indian culture well every culture really mm. so um, so um, uh, your work on liver cleanse can you first explain to people what is it exactly and uh, should everyone do it or people should do it only if they have a problem first of all there's no shoulds right if somebody is feeling like they don't have any energy like they're stuck they're stagnant they're not losing weight it could be because of a dirty liver also because of the liver needing to be cleansed the diet uh, is simple that we were providing for people the liver cleanse basically uh we want to there are some stones in our liver you can call them stones you can call it sludge maybe doctors won't call it stones you don't necessarily see it on an x-ray uh, but the liver gets dirty because it it's such a large organ and it works so hard and we we tend to abuse it and then it's just very resilient so it is an incredible organ but it needs some cleansing and the way to do it is uh we do it with apple juice so we make fresh apple juice and we have about i think it's about 32 ounces a day at different intervals and then at the same time it's a eating cleanse so the way we were doing it in in new delhi of course is we provided the meals we would provide three meals a day and at night was always a soup and salad lunch was always our heavier meal and breakfast was mostly raw raw food you know and some and the juice and so for five and a half days you're eating healthy and different food no caffeine no chocolate no sweets no alcohol no sugar but vegan healthy food tasty and tasty always tasty that's number one you've got to make it taste good and then at the end of the time now we have softened the stone so the last 16 hours of the cleanse the last two days are a little harder you start eating on the 6th day in the afternoon and in the evening you start a regime of epsom salt drinks and olive oil and uh, juice and then in the next day in the morning also the same we had very good results in new delhi people eliminated a lot of stones and felt really great afterwards i remember there was one lady who i think for one year her skin was irritating her and she was always itching and she tried everything she tried raw food she tried regular medicine ayurvedic medicine she tried nothing was helping she did the liver cleanse and she said during the cleanse it was uncomfortable i was still having body aches and itching but as soon as i finished the cleanse it went away 99% so there was one person on the cleanse who because she didn't have coffee on the cleanse but she was finished she automatically stopped drinking coffee you know because once you eliminate something from your diet and you go back to it then you see what that food really does so what does coffee do for us it affects our nervous system and if you some people drink coffee to help eliminate every morning without their coffee they can't eliminate that's not allowing the body to naturally eliminate coffee hits the nervous system if you are a angry person or you have anger inside of you when you drink a cup of coffee it's going to be easier for that anger to explode but if you're drinking a nice cup of tea that's calming it will help you to not act and react there was i remember one lady did my cleanse and she had 
She had 200 employees. And uh, her employees wondered what she was doing because all week she wasn't yelling at them. And they said, what are you, what's so different? What are you doing? Or one mother with her little kids, the kids also noticed something was different because she also wasn't yelling at them. Because when your nervous system is stronger and calmer, then you're able to handle the stresses of life. And we all have plenty of stresses. They, you know, they're always going to come. It's kind of how we, hand, it's how we handle them. They, won't, they will come, but how do we handle them is what counts. And you can handle them being... One of the greatest lessons I learned from somebody is I was having a conversation and it wasn't going that well. And this person looked at me and she goes, you're irritating me. And I thought to myself, well, who's irritable, her or me? I'm not irritable, she is. And so we want to put our, our irritation on somebody else. Now, if you react to that, now you're part of it and you're also irritable. But if you just stay calm within yourself, anybody can say anything to you. You don't have to react because it's not personal. Mm -hmm. She was the one who was irritable, not me. Right, and that right. was a great lesson. It was a great lesson. So, yeah, so moving on to the liver cleanse program. Uh, generally, if anyone yeah. you advise that, okay, that you should get and uh, take up a liver cleanse program, they would assume that they have been recommended this be maybe because they have a drinking problem. Because generally we consider yes. drinking a lot to liver. But I assume there are many sure. other key lifestyle activities which someone is doing that is affecting their liver. So what are those yes. activities that uh, might affect the liver other than drinking? Medicine, pharmaceuticals, drugs, toxicity from our air, our water, our automobiles. So many reasons that affect the liver. We don't always, unless you're living out in the beautiful countryside where the air is fresh and clean and you're drinking beautiful well water and you know where it's coming from. I once asked somebody in New Delhi, I said, what, what is the actual story on our water here? Is it good water? He said, you know, the water is good. We have good plants, water plants in India. Our pipes are old. It's the piping that makes it bad. Mm. That's why we don't drink, drink directly. We have filters or we drink bottled water. We boil our water. Mm. And then we have all these RO systems to purify the water. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And then, like I say, all these, these you know, wh where do you buy your butter? Do you get it from a cow? Do you get it from a mudge? No, no, not accessible in big cities. Right, so you have butter that's made in a big factory. Machines, people, fat, you know, get it cheap as you can get it so you can put it out there and make more money. So any product, how about your cleaning supplies? We clean the house with, what we wash the floor with, what we do the tiles with, what we our dishwashing soap. These are all manufactured products that have some kind of toxicity in them. All the non-organic foods we eat, the herbicides, the pesticides, that's poison to our body. Monsanto, the farmers who can't renew their seeds, they have to buy more seeds to plant because they're GMO. So, you know, there's just, everywhere we look, there's something that's not healthy for us. Mm. The air, I mean, look at the air in New Delhi sometimes during... In November during Diwali, actually. It's the worst ever. There's always alerts. The kids have to not be outside to play in school. They can't go outside because of... So all these kind of things. The dirt, you know. The... Um, urinating in the street, you know. The spitting in the street. The smoking cigarettes in the street. Um, there is a lot of cleanup that needs to be done around you to prevent toxicity. Mm. That's Any true. aerosol spray cans, spray cans, you know? I mean, if you really sat and observed your household and looked around, you can probably count many things that are toxic. Yeah. So, ma'am, um, 
you're 70 now how do you manage to look uh, that young and that active i think it's just healthy eating healthy living and healthy eating and exercise the three pms positive movement positive meals positive mind i think that's what it is you have to incorporate everything it's never one i don't take medicines i don't um uh, I don't have a lot of processed food. I eat organic food. I eat mostly vegan. Uh, I, I, one shouldn't be a fanatic about anything, and one shouldn't push your thing on anybody else. Um, but just eat more consciously, you know, and exercise and live a, a lifestyle that makes you fulfilled and content. And breathe, you know, breathing is so important. You have to breathe. You have to be aware of your breath. You have to have something that makes you sit down and relax and to meditate and to take it all in. And again, I, I mentioned the word faith. You know, it's like when, the wor when it looks the worst, when we look like the worst thing is happening us, to us in our life, it never really is. It only looks that way. And if, at that moment, if you can just have a little bit of faith and know, okay, this is what it is right now. Tomorrow's another day. And this might lead me to something else that's much more positive and much more fulfilling. So, and, and that's really rough because some really bad things can happen to a person, you know, illness, car accidents, um, so many things that look awful while it's happening. But you have to find the bright side in everything and know maybe what's happening now is going to be something fantastic down the road. So it's an attitude, and then you have to live in that attitude of gratitude. It's very important to have gratitude and, and to thank the universe. That is very well said. Give attitude the uh, gratitude. So uh, now coming back to you, how do you prime yourself for the day? Do you have a morning routine? I do have, I call it a... A, a um, lazy person's yoga routine in the morning, you know, so there are several exercises that I do. It's a combination of some Kundalini yoga and somatic movements. And I, and that it really gets me going. And it has actually changed my body because the beginning of COVID, I also found myself gaining some weight. And uh, because we really in the beginning weren't active, we really did stay in, you know, nobody knew what was really going on. And I used to also go to the gym a lot and I completely stopped going to the gym and I have never even gone back to the gym. Uh, I didn't do that much. I like doing the treadmill, elliptical, just movement, you know? Um, so I'll do my routine that I kind of created for myself and it works. And I either I will eat something or I'll go take a walk after that. Uh, go down to the beach. I only live 12 minutes from, you know, taking a walk on the ocean and then start my day. You don't want to be fanatic about anything. Listen to your body. It tells you what it needs. You know, I, I don't eat dairy products, but um, recently uh, my body told me to eat some goat yogurt. And so I'm eating some goat yogurt. I felt I needed that for my gut. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to listen to your body. It's really important. And everybody's is the same but everybody's their sensitivities are different you know we are we are the same we're made the same we have an incredible machinery but it operates differently for everybody and so you have to really listen to yourself what worked really good for one person may not work really good for the next person mm -hmm. so you have to tune into your needs and you can experiment if i eat this food it makes me feel this way if i eliminate this food i feel this way if I'm exercising so hard and I'm not losing weight, there's something else I'm not doing to my body. Mm. That's, that's true. So a clean gut, a clean gut, a clean liver, stomach, how you digest your food, um, all of these things are very important for your well-being and your calm mind. It's our mind that we have to calm down. And the greatest gift to calm the mind is eating calming foods and uh, breathing, breathing exercises are really, really so important. Mm. So many yoga teachers today, they teach you yoga, but they don't teach you how to breathe. They don't incorporate breathing. 
So breathing is what calms you down. And even just simple, you find yourself uptight, you find yourself anxious, you find yourself scared. You just sit down and long deep breathe, you know, four breaths in, four breaths out. You're a different person. So breath is very valuable. That's true. Means, yeah, many, many yoga teachers have been primarily focusing on helping you perform that difficult asana so that it could look aesthetically pleasing. But yes, the more important part of how to breathe is just missing in all these yoga classes. But that's really important what you just said because yoga is not about how it looks. It's about what it does to you, body, mind, and soul. It's not about that at all. For me, you know, I know somebody is very good in their postures and they can do this and they can do that. And that means their body is flexible. And hopefully with a flexible body, you can have a flexible mind. Yoga and then you're going out at night and drinking and, you know, eating a lot of sugar. Maybe you're not going to feel good even though you'd feel worse if you didn't do the yoga. So the yoga is definitely helping you so it's a combination of everything is really what i'm trying to say it's just not one thing yes actually thing. actually if someone who hasn't been let's say doing yoga or let's say do, not doing meditation gets into the habit of doing it and he might let's say do for three months four months once he stops doing it he realizes that what he's missing on and uh, that's when you realize the true value of it well, that's very true. I mean, for a good part of my adult life, being in a spiritual group family that practiced yoga and meditation, it's like, you got to get up, you got to get up for your sadhana, you got to do your yoga, you got to do your meditation. It's like, nobody wants to be told what to do. And so you go through different periods of when you do it, you do it to learn and be disciplined and you know it helps you, then you stop for a while. You don't do it, you know. I don't want to do this. I don't want to get up early in the morning. You go through different stages, but then ultimately, that really makes me feel good. I think I'll do it. But you're doing it because you have an experience now, and that experience makes you feel good. And it's because of the experience. Now you want to do it, not because somebody told you you should, not that he said this is the only way to enlightenment. You do it because, wow, this works. And now it's no longer difficult to do. And don't be hard on yourself if you, if you stop, you know. Okay, so this period of my life, I'm not doing it. It's okay. You know, I'll get back to it when the time is right. So people are so hard on themselves. Mm. Don't be. So speaking about... Love, love yourself. So speaking about your practices, do you have any practice which you make sure you do every time and especially if in case you have a very short period of time let's say just 10 minutes 20 minutes you make sure to do this one specific practice well the first thing i do is i do a very rapid cat and cow like 108 cat and cows really fast and that just gets me going and from that i slide into a um a, a cobra and then back down up and down a cobra and then after that, I stay up in Cobra and I'll sit there and I'll do a breathing exercise, a breath of fire for a minute. And then from that, I'll do up and down Cobra. So now I'm working my arms a little bit too. And then I'll do, a, I'll end it with maybe a plank or a, a, the men do it a different way than the yoga people. So I try to hold that for a minute or so. And I just kind of do it fast. You know, it's like da, 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 da. You don't have to do it fast, but it works for me. And then it starts. I'll do what I call somatic movements. They're different movements. Um, I'll do a whole set of that. And uh, so I, I make sure I do about, I think about 40 minutes, you know, and I just, I just do it. And sometimes I'll do some of it on my bed. I'm lazy. You know, some of the movements I can just do right on my bed. And that, I actually want to make a video of it and just call it the lazy person's yoga set, morning routine. And it, it just works for me, you know, so. I, I, it wakes me up and it gets me going and my blood, you know, gets going and my energy starts, you know, being uplifted and makes you feel good. So you do what makes you feel good. A lot of people say, well, medicine makes me feel good. <laughs> well, 
You know, yeah. You know, smoking dope makes me feel good. Drinking alcohol makes me feel good. But then you have to think about what it does to you physiologically and what it does to your brain, what it does to your blood, what it does to your body, what it does to your mind. Is it an addiction? Is it, you know, casual? So just be natural, how God intended us to be. And again, speaking about teachings, again, we have just reached to the end of a show. What message or what learnings would you like to share with everyone? Love yourself. Like yourself, love yourself, know yourself, and nurture yourself. Be good to yourself. It's most important. And then there's a lot of technologies, how to get there. <laughs> Lots of tools and technologies. Lots of tools and technology. There's so many. They're so available. Mm. And, and we need help. You know, putting on a yoga video is great. You know, Zoom class is great. If, if you need that, do that. That's wonderful. There's so many tools out there. But mm. take care of you. I think that's my message of the day. Take care of you. Yes. That, that is something which people should keep reminding of uh, themselves that, yes, this is like a practice that we should look after ourselves, take care of ourselves, look and feel how our body is reacting and acting to things. See what's all around you. Look behind the words, look behind the motions, the movement. Tune in. Mm-hmm. That... This this specific point, I guess we just had uh, have been discussing off and on, but uh, slowly I've been noticing, and this is especially after my own meditation practice. Whenever I talk to someone, I've noticed that they are saying something, but something else is going in their mind, and this has happened to me only after meditation. Before I was completely blind to this fact. But just realizing with their body movements, with their facial expressions, there is a lot that they're expressing, but that's not coming out from their mouth. (laughs) True. So I want to share with you a new show that I'm starting. It's called Out of the Box, Inside the Heart. So that will be a new YouTube show that's coming soon. Wow. Wow. I'll I'll definitely, uh, if in case we, as we release the episode out, I'll definitely make sure to link the new show as well as all your episode links or website links in the show yeah. notes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good luck Bye. with your show. Yeah. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you. Good luck with the work too.